Sudan regarding this new research branch of our group. Actually, we started a, a, a research in this area maybe three years ago, something like that. So uh, I will try to summarize, to tell you a little bit about uh, what, we, uh, what kind of uh, structure we investigated and what has been happening for our results. So uh, these are the, the people involved from, from my group, involved in this uh, new research area. Uh, Marina is a professor at the University of Buenos Aires and uh, Anna Luna, she is a, a, a PhD student. Uh, she will be finishing her thesis probably by the end of this year. And Andres is a postdoc student. Uh, of course, uh, the first thing that we needed uh, to do when we decided to get into this new area was to find collaborators <laughs> that know a lot more than, uh, than us uh, about biology and about the species that we were going to start. So we collaborate with, uh, from one hand, with uh, uh, people from the Department of Entomology in the Museum of uh, Natural Sciences in Buenos Aires, and we also collaborate <coughs> with uh, people from the uh, biology department in our university. So, uh, first of all, in this uh, part of the lecture, I will tell you about uh, different uh, kinds of uh, structures that can generate structural columns. Uh, among them, uh, there are diffraction gratings, multi layers, photonic crystals, and random structures like the white beetles I told you already. Then we will discuss a little bit about the properties of the color, such as iridescence and the metallic effect. And uh, I will comment about the biological functions. Um, uh, our contribution in this uh, research area uh, has several parts. Uh, the first part is uh, to identify the species that exhibit particular uh, characteristics that should be studied, should be investigated. Then uh, we need to characterize the microstructure. We need to observe it by, by different uh, techniques uh, to understand uh, very well how uh, is this uh, structure formed, what are the features, what are the, the sizes, everything. Then we elaborate an electromagnetic model to be able to reproduce the results that we get from the natural structures. And then we analyze the uh, novel effects, for example, that can be useful for, for biologists, for example, to find what is important, why for this species is important to have this uh, color effect for biological functions and also for the design of novel materials. So, um, this is more or less the, the, the systems that we already studied. The, the first one is a crab that exhibits a structural color, bluish uh, color. Then uh, we did a rather deep uh, research on these Ceroglossus suturalis beetles. These beetles are uh, one of the most uh, studied in Anna Luna's thesis. Uh, then we also investigated uh, a type of mixomycetes that are like a fungi uh, that also exhibits a structural color. I did not mention in my previous uh, lecture that also fungi exhibit this kind of color, but uh, actually I think it was not known that uh, this was the case. So uh, we did, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, we did the, best the first uh, research on the structural color in fungi. 
And then I will discuss a little bit about some applications that uh, we can have regarding to biomimetics and the future work. So this is the first, uh, our first, first uh, specimen uh, that was investigated. That here you can see that at the end of this uh, swimming paddle, that is here a bigger image, uh, you can see like a bluish or purple color. So uh, if we cut this, uh, this paddle, then uh, uh, this uh, transversal cut of this, we can uh, find <coughs> this kind of structure that is basically a multi-layer. And um, these layers are uh, of different uh, composition. Uh, usually uh, the materials <coughs> that are involved in biological structure are dielectrics that have uh, refraction indices between 1 and 2.5, something like this. And uh, so basically this is like a one-dimensional photon crystal. Uh, so the, the schematic view of the of this structure is like this. So we have a multi-layer, basically with, uh, formed by two different uh, materials, the red and the white one represented here by these colors. And on the top, there is a random surface on the top here that also contributes to the, to the coloration. So um, in this case, the, the two layers are one is just the uh, air and the other one is heating. Heating is one of the uh, biological uh, materials that are more widespread in beetles, in butterflies, in many of these uh, species. So uh, you can see, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see, but there are here like vertical uh, barbules, I don't know if you can see them, these vertical uh, barbules uh, uh, are uh, responsible of keeping these air gaps between heating layers, so making the, this <coughs> proper multilayer uh, structure. So here are some results uh, on this uh, case, some curves that we generated with a very simple model of a uh, multilayer structure. And then we can see that uh, depending on the number of layers, so here are these, the three curves here correspond to different number of, uh, of layers. So uh, even though uh, as you increase the number of layers, the curve changes a little bit, but always you have most of the reflectance in this region of the spectrum, and this is a characteristic <coughs> of the photonic band gap. So this is uh, just, uh, you can see that in this region, the structure almost uh, reflects all the, all the, the, the variation. So this region is uh, a photonic band gap uh, that is open because of the multilayer multilayer structure. And here you can see that when you move, this is a reflectance as a function of the angle of incidence. And as you change the angle of incidence, of course, the photon <coughs> gap also changes, and then giving a different coloration uh, depending on the angle. This is our uh, next uh, uh, species, that is a uh, Cerebrosus suturalis beetles. These beetles are, uh, the images of these beetles are here and here. You can see that there are two kinds of, of these beetles. One is uh, uh, the one we call the, the green one, which is uh, rather green with some orange, uh, orange lines and segments. Uh, and the other one, which is more brown, uh, color. This is just the, the map of our country to show you where we can find uh, this kind of, of beetles. Uh, of course, we, we have chosen this uh, species <coughs> because 
uh, it, they are easily found in, in our country, not only because they exhibit a structural color, and you can see that uh, both of them can be found in the south of our country or in Chile also in the Patagonia region. Um, so this is a, a summary of the characterization that is, as I told you before, the first step of our research. So, uh, of course, we observe the samples with the optical microscope uh, with the different uh, amplifications and uh, then uh, you can see here uh, that the green one, uh, although it's mostly green when you look it from far away, there are some red or brown uh, ridges or lines that also contribute to the color. <coughs> so if you, we get closer uh, with a scanning electron uh, microscope, then we can uh, investigate the, the top surface and we all the time compare the surfaces of both of them because although uh, they are uh, different uh, colors, they exhibit different colors, their structures are pretty much the same. Uh, you can see that uh, on the top surface there are like uh, bumps uh, that also can generate interference effects. Here uh, is uh, the electron cross section. If you cut, if you cut this part, the electron is, is covered on the middle. If you cut it transversally, then if you look at this, you will find a structure like this with like layers also uh, as in the case of, of the crab but the interesting thing is that uh, the layers here are uh, rather thick compared to the to the visible wavelength so at the first at the first uh, glance we said okay so we found the multilayer structure that uh, is responsible for the color, but then, no, no, wait, this structure cannot be responsible for that because these layers are very thick. So we kept looking for a different structure and then we found, I don't know if you can see this here, up here, there is another series of, of very, very thin layers. So it's like a two, uh, uh, two sets of multilayers, one rather thick and the other one very thick. So, and of course, this one, which is on the top, uh, is uh, responsible for the coloration. So, here is a closer view of the of the electron cross section, where you can see the layers here. And I am not sure, but probably you can see also that uh, there are like uh, different kinds of layers. The one that has this uh, structure and the other one that is almost homogeneous. So the layers here are not uh, just air and chitin, but in this case you have chitin and melanin, two different uh, substances that are present in this uh, structure. And you can see here on the top, surface and also you have the, these bumps as we saw before. Um, okay, this is just a zoom view of this and you can see these uh, multi-layers, the thin ones that are the responsible for the color. So after uh, identifying these uh, layers as a responsible for the color, then we need to uh, better characterize the structure and to know, for example, how many layers do we have, uh, what uh, are the thicknesses of these layers, etc. So we made a deep uh, study on this, and this is more or less the, the conclusion. For the green beetle, we found only nine periods 
meaning uh, nine pairs of layers. And uh, the keeping layer thickness is about 100 nanometers, and the melanin layer thickness is about 60 nanometers. But in the case of the brown uh, beetle, we have uh, about 20 uh, periods, much more than in the green case. The keeping layer thickness is 120 nanometers in this case, and the melanin layer thickness is 70 nanometers. So you can see that. The, the total period of the structure is different. Here it is about 190 nanometers and here it is 160. So this difference in the period will give a different position of the bank gap uh, and then a different coloration. So this is the, the model uh, to reproduce the results that we obtain. We, in this model, of course, is very simplified compared with the real structure. Uh, we consider a binary planar material system, which is uh, finite in the sense that it has a finite number of layers. So we can put in our model the exact number of layers that we count in the structure. Uh, we can consider normal and oblique incidence. This is important because if you are, we are interested in studying the iridescent effect, then we should be able to, to uh, illuminate the structure by a different <coughs> angle of incidence. Uh, okay, it is a periodic, perfectly periodic uh, structure. Uh, it has the translational symmetry in this direction, and meaning that it's infinite in this direction. And it has invariance symmetry in this direction also is infinite in this direction So this is basically the, the formulation, but this is just a very simple propagation uh, algorithm from layer to layer. Uh, of course, for, uh, to find the reflectance of the response of these uh, structures, uh, you need to solve the complete electromagnetic uh, problem. You, it is not uh, uh, enough to use uh, programs that uh, provide you with the uh, dispersion relation or something like that because you cannot uh, consider a completely infinite structure in this, in this uh, direction. Of co and of course we need also to include in our model the substrate and the substrate that are also formed by this same uh, material that I mentioned before. In this case, the refraction indices of these uh, two uh, ketin and melanin are here, 155 roughly for ketin and 2 for melanin. So this was like our first approach 
that helped us to say, okay, we are just uh, in the right direction, we know the sizes, we can characterize the structure, but we need to, to improve this. So, um, in the meantime, I will make like a parenthesis. And uh, so one of the, <coughs> of the facts that we faced during the development of this research was how uh, can we know if our model is right compared with the real structure? Because uh, uh, at the end, we can see the color of the, of the beetle, so we should obtain a color from our model and see if both colors are similar. So then uh, I will just make a very, very short uh, introduction on how usually color can be represented, but basically there are many, many different uh, uh, systems uh, in which you can represent a color uh, one of them is the x, y, z uh, coordinate. By these three coordinates, you can give like a, a, these are the, the is the complete uh, way of defining a color. So these uh, coordinates are related to uh, from one hand to the uh, reflectance of the sample, which is here. R of lambda means the reflectance of the sample. And this D of lambda represents the spectrum that is emitted by the illumination lamp that you are using. So um, these two uh, functions are uh, relevant, very relevant to uh, defining the different uh, coordinates that define the, the color. But also you have here uh, this a small x, y, and z, and these uh, these other uh, functions are related uh, to how uh, our eyes uh, receive the different colors. So, is this part of the of the definition is related to the sensitivity of our eyes to receive the different colors coming from different wavelengths. So these are, these are very well known uh, curves. These parameters are given here. This is, these are very, very well known curves that you can find in any book or even in the internet everywhere. So this is basically the response of our eyes to the different um, uh, colors and then uh, it should be included in our uh, color coordinates that we are uh, trying to, to find. So basically, these are known curves. This D of wave of lambda should be known because it is related with the lamp that we are using, so the spectrum of this lamp should be known. And basically, we know the, the lamp and we know this, Basically, we find, we can find by means of our model this, the reflect, this reflectance and then we can find the three coordinates that usually define the color. So, this is an example of a D of lambda. So this is the response of one of the lamps that are used. This represents a white, a, a white light. But you can use any other lamp. So, if we uh, introduce in this uh, R of, of lambda the, our results that we obtain with our model, then we will be able to obtain the color that would, <coughs> would be observed if the sample would have this response. And then this color could be compared with the real color that we observe in the sample. So this is a typical uh, chromaticity diagram. But you can see that this is a two-dimensional plot. You have x here and y here. But uh, 
uh, I said that uh, you have uh, x, y, and z, three coordinates to define the color. So where is the, the z, the other coordinate? Well, the other coordinate basically relates with the intensity of the color, with the brightness, but not with the, with the tone of the coloration. So usually uh, colors are uh, represented in these kinds of uh, diagrams and you can see that depending on the values of these coordinates it means that you are having a blue, for example in this region, or a green, or a yellow. But of course, all the colors that we can have are not uh, summarized here because the other coordinate also is completes this diagram. So, if we uh, plot here, the, we calculate the color coordinates with, the, with our results from our model for the, this beetle, then we get here like uh, this very green, bright color for the green one, and this like uh, red, brown uh, color for the brown. Although, uh, the, the tone of these uh, this, uh, colors is rather good, uh, it is still not uh, very accurate. So, uh, the, the next uh, step was uh, to include losses in our model and then we uh, needed to, need to know, wanted to know if uh, the inclusion of losses uh, makes our resolution more accurate. So this is not, a, of course, including losses demands a, some manipulation inside the algorithm and everything, the Maxwell equation and everything, but this is from one side. From the other side, the problem is that it is not very easy to find uh, in the literature uh, the values of the real values of the imaginary part of the refraction index for these kinds of materials. Usually biologists that report on this kind of structure don't care too much about the refraction index. So it is rather difficult to get these values and of course to measure them is also very difficult. So this is one of the difficult parts of the of, uh, of this kind of, of research. But of course, uh, we managed to, to find some publications, some references of this, and we did some calculations in which uh, you can see this, uh, th this different uh, curves correspond to increasing the imaginary part of the kidney layer. And you can see, as soon as you increase the, this, uh, the losses, then you approach uh, the, the black curve here that is uh, represent the experimental results, the measured results. And the same occurs for the other samples, the brown one. So basically, we also wanted to, to show that, the, that there is an iridescent effect going on there in this, in this sample, and, and to do so, we need to uh, to investigate how the response changes with the angle. So uh, you can see here in this uh, scheme that uh, although if, if you send a light in the normal direction, since the electron has a certain curvature, then uh, for example, if you illuminate this region here, uh, the specular reflection will be right in the normal direction. But here, for example, if you uh, uh, illuminate with the same normal direction, uh, locally, this angle of incidence is no longer normal, so you have a different angle of incidence, and then the reflected uh, light will be gone in some other angle and not in the normal direction. And this, of course, even uh, this effect is much more uh, strong if uh, we look at this more outer, more external parts of the of the, the electron. So then we investigate the response as a function of the incidence angle, 
and you can see also that the peak uh, that is basically the responsible for the color uh, is shifted uh, as soon as you increase the incidence angle also uh, showing that the, there is an incidence uh, effect. So to, to look at this uh, better, then here we, can, we, we plot the reflectance as a function of the incidence angle here and of the wavelength here. And uh, basically the, the, the green here, the zones, corresponds to the higher reflectance. So you can see that the, this photonic uh, band gap moves to shorter wavelengths and as soon as you increase the angle of incidence in both cases. This is exactly what we need to explain the ESS. So here is just a representation of the color uh, found uh, theoretically using the model that, that I already told you and experimentally taking the measurements as the R of lambda and then calculating the coordinates using this uh, measure reflectance. And you can see that these different dots here correspond to different uh, angles of incidence, but you can see that more or less uh, you get very, very similar results. And this, this uh, square here represents the colors uh, found for the different uh, angles of incidence. And this is uh, the same but for the brown beetle, and you can see that uh, we get much more brown coloration. So it looks like, uh, uh, like uh, we found a way of reproducing all the, the characteristics, the structural characteristics of this, uh, of this bit. So uh, as a conclusion of this thesis, uh, we can say that both uh, specimens uh, are natural photonic structures um, the, the epic particle that is the external part of the electron uh, is uh, really a periodic uh, multilayer. Uh, this uh, microstructure produces structural color and iridescence effects. And the developed electromagnetic model can deal with the layers of isotropic, anisotropic, ideal, or lossy materials. Uh, it predicts the, the reflectance peak uh, in excellent agreement with the measurements and as we take into account the losses, the theoretical reflectance matches the measured one much better and of course the uh, iridescence has also been demonstrated uh, for the different incidence So this regarding the cerebrosus structuralis and this and now I will tell you about the other system that we have been investigating, this is uh, the fungi I told you, the, it's called the Achaea leucopoda. Uh, leucopoda means, I am learning a lot with this new branch because uh, actually uh, I, I don't know, uh, I didn't know much about biology and now with this new branch I am learning a lot from our collaborators. So it's a very challenging also uh, to collaborate with them because we just uh, have to settle the common language, so it's very, very interesting. But uh, I was telling you that leucopoda means, uh, leuco means white. So, and poda means, uh, 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 foot, like a white foot. So this is the, the, the name of, the, of this fungi. Uh, the total height of this fungi, the total length from here to here, is about one millimeter. So you cannot uh, uh, see them easily, but they are uh, easily found. Uh, of course, easily if you know what are you looking for, but I mean, it's not, uh, they, they grow many, many, many places, but, but uh, under certain particular uh, weather conditions. 
So these are some uh, images taken with the optical microscope. The, the very the interesting thing uh, of this uh, of this uh, fungi is that it exhibits uh, like uh, multicolor dots, and uh, uh, of course the, 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 it is very uh, very strange how do, how do we got. Uh, they are to, to start investigating uh, this, uh, this kind of, of fungi. Uh, uh, actually, the, there is a, the, our collaborators who are studying this fungi for many years, and they just mentioned that uh, they are beautiful, they are multicolor, but they don't have uh, any idea of what was this for and, and how is this generated. So we try to help them. And then we make some observation. You can see that here it looks like uh, like uh, holes or like cavities, but each cavity has like its own color. And here are some uh, images of um, of the cover. So this, if you if you cut it, this is a, a cut. Uh, specimen and it is basically like a, a, a cover and inside uh, of it is a full of spores. These little things here are spores that uh, enable them to reproduce but uh, all this uh, is like a tree inside of the spores that is surrounded by a cover and this cover, which is called the peridium, this cover is uh, transparent. You can see this cover here, and this it is uh, very very thin, and uh, also exhibits like bumps. This is a cut of the peridium, peridium cross section, and we did a lot of cuts, a lot of images to understand what was going on there. And at the end, uh, we found that there are <coughs> layers also, layers of different uh, 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 composition. And uh, so we basically, we interpret this, uh, this phenomenon in this way. So when you illuminate this iridium, this structure, which is, has many, several layers, uh, we have reflection in different uh, directions and then we should investigate what is going on with the different angles because since, since the, the structure is so small then you are collecting light coming from very many different directions when you look at them under the microscope. So it was very important to know the response, the angular response. So basically we uh, uh, proposed a very simple model, just a slab, where in this uh, part we represent the refraction index of this composite material and we investigated the response as a function of different uh, parameters and uh, then we found that, uh, for example, these are it's the same representation of the color, uh, in this case for normal incidence and varying the refraction index, basically the refraction index uh, multiplied by the thickness of the, of the layer of the peridium. And you can see that all these dots follow this path in such a way that uh, when you change this uh, thickness and, and, the, and the refraction index and at the same time, you just change colors and pass through most of the colors, so you have all the possibilities there. This is another example for two fixed uh, incidence angles, for a fixed uh, thickness and for a fixed uh, refraction index. And you see that the evolution of the, of the color is also going from the blue to the orange is also passing through the pink one. So uh, changing the angle, you can also change the color. And this is another example uh, for another thickness. 
So the thing was that the thickness, the, the real, the real thickness of this uh, structure here, we measured the thickness in different uh, samples, and we found that in some regions it is about uh, 100 nanometers, and in some other regions maybe up to 700. So there are local variations of the thickness, and these variations also uh, can produce the different colors that are uh, diff the different colors that you can find locally in different places. So this was uh, just a, a, a anecdote uh, that uh, it was published an article in the newspaper uh, because it was the first. Uh, evidence of structural color in fungi, this was last, uh, last year. Uh, so, regarding uh, the use of these uh, structures for our own profit, human profit, uh, there is a, a new branch of <coughs> science that is devoted to mimic uh, natural systems uh, to uh, design the devices or machines or different kinds of things. For example, the microstructure of the lotus leaves, you know the lotus that is a, a, like a flower that lives on the top of the uh, water surfaces. So uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, has also a very particular structure that uh, it inspired in this uh, structure, paints and fibers uh, have been fabricated uh, that are easy to clean. Also, uh, uh, the structural color in butterflies that I show you today uh, inspired makeups based on photonic uh, uh, products instead of pigments. Actually, L'Oreal, for example, uh, they are developing some makeups based on this. Uh, Mechanism also in uh, light diodes of high emission, uh, for example, he inspired on the addition of, uh, of the lizards on the walls, new synthetic adhesives have been developed, and inspired, for example, in the white beetle that I showed you today, uh, they are trying to improve uh, the, the, the white color of paper to fabricate. Uh, paper of better quality and also fabrication of new white light sources, paints, etc. And um, there are many, many other applications that are being developed. Some of them are listed here, for example, compound lenses for, uh, for solar cells. Uh, these systems are inspired in the compound eyes of several insects. Uh, self-repairing solar cells, bio-inspired uh, robots, uh, bio-inspired wings for aircraft, uh, polymers with particular purposes, <coughs> replication of uh, optical and hydrophobic features using butterfly wings as templates. This is being done actually in uh, motion systems uh, that also mimic nature. I have put here some examples. Um, this is the compound eye that is, uh, is much better than our eyes and this um, is an example of mimicking nature for a, for a human profit and for example here uh, they are using, um, uh, they are fabricating artificial muscles for human like uh, robots also based on the nature. Uh, this is a very funny, very big, uh, like a caterpillar inspired uh, rolling robot. It's actually, it rolls like a caterpillar. Um, that, uh, you can see here, this is the, the built uh, sample. Uh, there is another, uh, uh, for example, uh, aircraft that is inspired in the pterosaur uh, Flat, uh, no flat, uh, uh, wings, wings, and uh, you can see uh, here is uh, the model, 
and uh, here is the, 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 the species that inspired this uh, development because they have a different way of flying, different from the birds. And this is another example, uh, which is an epidermal lens effect that uh, pr produces like uh, dots, little dots, uh, because of the uh, multi-focusing in many, many different uh, places of the leaves to increase the absorption efficiency. So then that is like uh, light is focusing in many, many places, many, many dots to increase the, the absorption in this case. Also, these are this, the other application that I mentioned is uh, nat natural photonic crystal replication. Just you know that uh, to build a photonic uh, crystal is not easy, but if you use an already photonic structure, then it can be used as a template to build another uh, photonic structure. Of course, if you made it from a different material, then the properties will be probably a little bit different but this would be still a photonic crystal <coughs> and they, they, this, is, this has, is being done uh, now so um, regarding the future work we have some uh, other species that we are going to investigate we already started uh, making some research on these, these guys here and also other types of, of fungi that has different uh, uh, response. In this case, these uh, fungi are, are blue, basically blue, but also exhibit a uh, structural uh, color. Also, we are going to start investigating diatoms. Uh, these uh, diatoms are uh, unicellular uh, uh, beings that uh, are everywhere, in every water, uh, rivers, lakes, sea waters, and they are covered by silicon dioxide and they have uh, many, many different uh, shapes, but they are usually like photonic crystals. Um, they have regular structures of channels and uh, micrometric and nanometric pores, as I will show you in the, in the next uh, slide. And they are very interesting from the point of view of applications uh, because they are uh, people are looking at them <coughs> as an uh, inspiration for photonic devices and artificial uh, nanomaterials, different kinds of, of detectors. You can see here some images of uh, the structures of these, these uh, diatoms. And you can see that even though they are different shapes and very, very strange uh, uh, creatures, uh, they uh, still exhibit uh, like a regular pattern of holes and so they are very, very interesting. So to summarize, to, in this second part, I told you about the structural color present in different species that we investigated, the crab, the beetle. Uh, we, I showed you how do we characterize the structures, then I told you about our fungi, very small fungi, and I showed you about the, the peridium that is uh, responsible for, for generation. I told you a little bit about biomimetics and the future work that we are planning to do in the, in the near future. So that's all. Thank you. Do you have some questions? Uh, I have one. Actually, it's related to the uh, picture, to the image that you showed here on the top right side of the slide. And I was curious, what is the function of this larger periodicity? Is there a need to maybe uh, reflect some this part? Uh, infrared light? Or Probably, yes. We, we think that this uh, should have a, a, <laughs> an explanation in another part of the spectrum. We did not uh, investigate uh, this yet because uh, we need also uh, to measure the response in this other part of the spectrum. So we are trying to find somebody to do that. But uh, we are, uh, we think that uh, the, the explanation of this will be in some other 
part, not in the visible range. Yeah. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes. What, what do you need three of those parameters to find the color? Uh, How? I'm sorry. So that you have X, Y, Z. Ah, the color parameter. Are there three types of sensors in our eyes or something? Yes. Okay. You know, I don't know the the, text, know the name the... in English, but uh, I know there are different sensors in our eyes. Some sensors are more sensitive to the blue. Some Rhodes sensors go to the come on. Rhodes and cones. Rhodes and cones. Okay. So <laughs> roads and cones are the different sensors that we have in the back of our eyes, in the retina, uh, that are responsible for these curves that I showed that. Uh, take into account the sensitivity of our eyes. Yes. Okay, more questions? Yes. In related to the model you use for that, those green and brown... Yes, beetles. Beetles. Uh, you used uh, a model where you have different layers of different uh, index, indices of refraction. Yes. But at the bottom, there was a, something that said substrate. Substrate. Yes. What did you use? It's a, it's a homogeneous region that is here. You can see this is a very thick region here. This is the substrate. Yeah. And this substrate is made of one of the, of the materials that uh, is composing this multilayer. Ah. So this is considered. You consider that as, a, as an infinite layer? An infinite. Yes, because the, this part is not, uh, is not relevant for this color. So if, even if you put all of this, the response will not change. We can do that, but this is not uh, relevant. Your, the response does not change. And the resolution of that model was analytical or uh, uh, You can do it. Uh, analytically, but uh, we have a program to do it because when you have, like here in 20 layers, for example, actually 40 because there are 20 periods, so you have 40 layers, then you have to propagate the field from one layer to the other. This is a very long calculation, so we do it by a program, computer program. Yeah, I have more questions. Uh, according to the picture on the bottom, middle bottom, uh, yeah, the, su the surface of the humps. What's yeah. the diameter of these humps? Uh, this is, these are uh, rather big. They are not uh, relevant for the diffraction point of view. They are rather wide. Yeah. The, I mean, the diameter of the of the, this cyber surface. What's the it's diameter? about 10, 10 uh, microns. Mm -hmm. It seems like it works. Uh, the diffusion surface makes a nice uniform. Uh, uh, I did not get it. Uh, in this, in the liquid crystal display, there is a there is a substrate using the diffusion sur sur 